Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's uh, Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Alec. I'm the MD of Wound Care People. And tonight's session is the burden of hard to heal wounds. Uh, this evening's session is in association with Smith & Nephew, so I'd like to start by uh, offering a, a very warm welcome to Smith & Nephew and a thank you for your support in putting together this event. And this evening, uh, we are joined by two wonderful speakers, uh, Jane Hampton, who's a consultant nurse in wound management from Aarhus Mun Municipality in Denmark, and Jackie Dark, who is the lead tissue viability specialist for Great Western NHS Foundation Trust. Um, yeah, so we're with uh, Jane from uh, uh, Aarhus Municipality in Denmark. Jane, good evening. Did I say that okay? Yes, yeah, not too bad. You need to practice a little bit longer, but it was pretty good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and Jackie, uh, so Jackie, for all of you watching at home, I'm sure that I'm not going to embarrass Jackie, but she hasn't been too well today, but she's trooping on and soldiering on to join us. So uh, Jackie, I, I, we really do appreciate you, uh, you, you, you. you giving up your time this evening. So thank you very much. How are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm all right. I'm holding up. It's amazing what a bit of makeup can do. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, OK, so as I said, uh, you'll probably see that, uh, as usual, uh, for the last 18 months, we're presenting these uh, from our from our homes. Uh, so if there are any technical issues, please just uh, please do bear with us. Um, ask as many questions as you can in the uh, in the chat function. I'll be back after the presentation for a live Q&A. Uh, as always, you'll be able to download the slides from our website from tomorrow. And there'll be a link at the end for you to be able to click on to uh, to get a copy of your certificate for your CP uh, for your revalidation uh, folders. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, I'm going to hand over to Jane. And ladies, good luck this evening. I shall see you back here after the presentation for the live Q&A. Thank you. Thank yes, thank, thank you very much, Alec. Um, as you've heard, my name is Jane Hampton and I am a wound consultant nurse working in Aarhus in Denmark. But as you can hear from my accent, I'm not Danish. I'm originally from New Zealand and I've actually worked for a number of years in southwest London before moving to Denmark, where I'm now working still as a wound specialist nurse um, and still in the community. I've worked in the community setting as a specialist for the last, yes, 20 odd years. Um, I'm particularly interested in hard to heal wounds and the financial impact that has. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you today about hard to heal wounds and what we can do about them. And interestingly, um, a lot of the issues that you guys have in the UK are very similar to the issues we have here in Denmark. So the healthcare services, we're challenged by an increasing number of patients with wounds. A recently published investigation by Guest and his colleagues estimated that in 2017-18, there were 3.8 million adult patients in the UK with a wound. And when compared to a similar study of five years previously, this is a 71% in the number of patients. And this has of course led to a considerably higher annual use of healthcare resources when compared to 2012, with among other things, an increase in community nurse visits by 399%, 100% more outpatient visits, visits and 164% more GP visits per year than in 2012. And this inc increase creates, of course, a corresponding economic burden for healthcare services. The annual cost of wound management in 2017-18 had increased by 84%. 84, 48% to a total of 8.3 billion pounds. The majority of costs at 81% are incurred in community-based services who account for 85% of the expenses related to chronic wounds and 68% of acute wound expenses. Somewhat worryingly, and why we are interested in intervening early in order to prevent hard to heal wounds, is the fact that 67% of wound management expenses are spent on managing unhealed wounds. One reason for this is that managing an unhealed wound costs on average 3,700 pounds, which is more than twice as much than the 1,500 pounds used to treat a wound that goes on to heal. It's not a surprise that unhealed wounds cost more to treat, but what is a surprise is that in guest study, unhealed wounds accounted for 30% of all wounds during the study year. So 67% of wound management costs 
are used on only 30% of wounds. Smaller prevalence studies of local caseloads, for example in England in 2013 and in Sweden in 2021, show that approximately 18% of wounds have been present longer than a year. So then it may not be 30% of your patients on your own caseloads, but it could still be close to 20% of your patients that have had a wound for longer than a year. We know that non-healing wounds often increase in size and have an increased risk of infection, which can come to require more frequent dressing changes, which in turn increase management expenses. So there is a financial incentive for us in, as wound care, sorry, as healthcare workers to address the issue of hard to heal wounds. Um, where are we here? But just as importantly, as the impact on the patient of having is the impact on the patient of having an unhealed wound. There can be pain and discomfort from the wound, anxiety about the wound's lack of progress, a loss of independence and disrupted daily routine with, for example, appointments at the GP practice or waiting for a home visit. A wound that is oozing or that smells can result in social isolation. Having a wound can alter the person's self-perception. And all of these changes that need to be contended with can lead to depression. And we mustn't forget the economic impact on the patient and society as a whole if the patient is absent from work, which can be a reality. As guest study showed that 67% of patients with a wound in 2018 were actually of working age. So in order to reduce the burden of hard to heal wounds, we need to be proactive. I participated in an international study in 2017, which investigated the effect of using PICO on hard to heal wounds. The study included 52 patients from four countries with a wound that had not shown signs of healing for at least four weeks. Some of the included wounds had been present for over a year. PICO was used for two weeks and the wounds were followed up for the next 10 weeks. The results led to the development of a pathway for using PICO to kickstart non-healing wounds. I'll show you why in the next few slides before suggesting that perhaps we should not wait for a wound to be non-healing before we kickstart it, but instead we need to be more proactive at the beginning of the treatment pathway. This slide shows the accumulated effect of using PICO on the combined 52 wounds. We can see that before PICO was used, the wounds were generally increasing in size by an average of three and a half percent each week. Once we started using PICO, the change in wound size was in a positive direction and the wounds became smaller, not only during the two weeks PICO was in use, but also during the subsequent 10 weeks that the wound was followed, giving an overall wound reduction of 7.2% per week. A comparison of the change in wound area before involvement in the study with the change in wound size whilst using PICO was found to be statistically significant. The healing rate was 13.4% faster whilst PICO was in use, faster than at baseline, and continued to be 9.6% faster over the following 10 weeks whilst normal treatment was again being used. And not surprisingly, faster healing rates can of course lead to wounds completely healing. Based on the rates of wound reduction during the four weeks before being enrolled in the study, it was predicted that only four of the 52 wounds would heal within the next six months. But what actually happened was that 14 wounds healed during the 12 week study. So of these non-healing wounds, just over 25% actually healed within three months. Based on the weekly wound size reduction rate for the remaining wounds during the 10 weeks after PICO was stopped, it was predicted that a further 18 wounds would go on to heal within the next six months. So overall, it seems that using PICO has the potential to heal 61.5%, basically 62% of hard to heal wounds. So that could definitely reduce the burden of having 30% of patients with a wound requiring treatment for longer than a year. A very interesting observation during the study was the relationship between how long the wound had been there and whether it healed or not with PICO. Basically, the shorter time the wound had been in existence, the more likely it was to heal. 
47% of wounds that were less than three months old healed within 12 weeks, whilst this healing response was reduced to only 29% of the wounds that had existed between three and six months. And for wounds that had been present for longer than six months, only 14% healed during the study period. Similarly, the number of remaining wounds predicted to heal within 26 weeks fell in line with how long the wound had been there. So according to the, to the data here, if we use PICO on wounds within the first three months of treatment, there is a potential to heal almost 50% within 12 weeks and over 90% within 26 weeks. So although PICO can kickstart healing in a wound that has been there longer than three months, it is considerably more effective if we think PICO into the treatment plan earlier within the first three months. So the question is, can we identify which wounds could benefit from using PICO early in a treatment pathway? And the answer, of course, is yes. There are lots of patient and wound-related risk factors that can delay healing. I've named just a few here. Older age by itself isn't necessarily a problem, but it can be if it is combined with other risk factors. I've named diabetes and smoking here, as these two factors were identified in the guest study as independently having a negative effect on the potential for a wound to heal. We already know that. And there was also a clear relationship between non-healing leg ulcers and the presence of diabetes. There are also wound-related factors that can help us to identify the risk of a wound becoming non-healing, such as weekly wound size reduction rates of under 10% each week. This means that we, as practitioners, need to be better at regularly monitoring wound size. We also need to be clear about signs and symptoms of infection, including the potential presence of biofilm. So we need to document what we can see so that we can inter intervene at an appropriately early point. I have a couple of cases here where we have used PICO early in the treatment plan. The first one is a 91 year old lady who has a traumatic wound under her knee following a fall. There is a connection under the skin between the area that has been uh, stitched and where the hematoma is. She is a smoker, she has poor mobility and leg edema and will absolutely not have any type of compression on her leg. So we started PICO with the second visit just nine days after the initial injury, after first removing the coagulated blood. PICO was used for seven days and the relatively low exudate level meant that the picoplasta didn't need to be changed during that week. After those seven days, the undermining between the two wounds was no longer there, and we reverted to our usual dressing products again. The wound, which could have been there for some months, was healed at six weeks. In this case, we have an 83-year-old man who was normally fully independent. He had fallen at home and developed pressure injury over his sacrum. He was in, in the hospital for four days and then came home to us. And in the first two weeks, our treatment plan concentrated on wound bed preparation, after which we then used PICO for two weeks. So again, we started PICO within four weeks of first having contact with the patient after assessing the risk of his wound potentially taking many months to heal. After 14 days with PICO, in the middle picture there, and just five weeks after first having contact with community nurses, he now had a wound that was less deep, had healthy granulation tissue, was smaller in circumference, and it went on to heal within four months. We assume that hard to heal wounds are the usual suspects of leg ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, and pressure ulcers, but we need to be aware that surgical wounds can also be challenging. In fact, Guest's investigation from 2018 showed that 14% of surgical wounds remained unhealed after a year. We experienced similar challenges in Denmark. We undertook a survey of surgical wounds where I work in 2017 because we were concerned that not all were healed when the sutures or clips were removed. We were surprised to find that as many as 40% of closed incisions required nurse input for longer than three weeks uh, post-operatively, and that 16% required treatment for longer than eight weeks. The wounds that were most likely not to be healed were abdominal operations, leg amputation, and vascular surgery that involve, involve the groin or lower leg. So all these sites are known to be at risk of surgical site infection or delayed healing. 
and our audit information led to the planning of a project between us and the community and our local hospital. We had a number of meetings in 2019 before it was decided that the orthopaedic department was an appropriate team to have a joint project with. So the actual project ran in 2020 and the results of our project will, will be presented as a post at UMA next year in February. So what I'll tell you here is the overall result, which fits nicely with our theme today. Major limb amputations are known to be high risk of delayed healing, not, not least because patients often have a combination of risk factors uh, such as diabetes, peripheral arterial disease, smoking, and often a high age. Our local orthopedic department initially didn't think there was a problem for their patients, mainly because they often don't see them again after discharge. As part of our project development, we were given ethical permission to collect retrospective data from the community patient journals for those who had been amputated in 2018. And this identified a problem, as 50% were not healed four weeks post-operatively, and 25% were still not healed at eight weeks. We used this data to plan the project that included all patients in Aarhus municipality who underwent femur amputation due to arteriosclerosis in 2020. And the three main interventions that we used were that the ward would inform the community tissue viability team when patients were discharged home. We then follow up, followed up with the community nurses a day or two later to hear what the incision site looked like and to inform them of the project. And this was important because many of our community nurses think it is normal for a surgical wound to produce exudate or to have a minor defect because that is what they so often see. And our key intervention was to start PICO as soon as there were signs of exudate from the wound or a defect in the incision. This was often within five days after discharge from hospital, but it could be three weeks later when the clips were removed. So we were interested in the effect of the early use of PICO on the amputations that had a de defect. So on this slide, you can see a comparison of the overall outcome of healing time, comparing usual practice in 2018 with the project interventions in 2020 for those amputations with delayed healing. There were fewer amputations in 2020, which may have been influenced by COVID-19 lockdowns. And the good thing was that there were fewer amputations that remained unhealed at four weeks, only 11. So this is a small study, but the results are interesting. The proportion of wounds that healed within eight weeks improved from only 50% under normal care to 64% when using PICO. And the average number of weeks that patients required treatment was reduced from six and a half weeks to five and a half weeks. A one week difference doesn't sound like very much, but that is one week less for the individual patient to live with an open wound. And if we multiply that one week by all the patients that are involved, which here is seven, that equates to seven weeks of nursing time and dressing products that were not required. Most impressive is the average time it took to heal 80% of the amputations that had a defect. This reduced to only 10 and a half weeks from a previous 17 weeks. So it would appear that by using PICO early in the treatment plan, we can improve the healing time of surgical wounds uh, that present with a defect, and therefore it will reduce the burden of an unhealed wound for both the patient and healthcare providers. So to sum up, don't wait, intervene early. We need to be aware of risk factors that can help us identify potentially challenging wounds. If we start PICO at the start of the treatment uh, pathway, we have a good chance of getting the wound to heal sooner and thereby reducing the social and psychological burden on the patient as well as the economic burden that slow and non-healing wounds have on healthcare providers. Thank you very much. That's what I would like to say to you guys today. Uh, so you've heard a little bit about what we're doing in Denmark and the burden from what's been looked at in England. And now I will hand over to Jackie, who will present some cases from the UK perspective for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. And thank you for your presentation and to the JCM for inviting me to speak tonight to our sponsors, Smith and Nephew. So as Alec um, mentioned earlier, my name is Jackie Dark. I'm the lead clinical nurse specialist for tissue viability within Great Western NHS Foundation Trust. So it's an integrated trust that sits within Wiltshire and it's an integrated trust of acute community and primary care. 
So my presentation this evening leads on from Jane, Jane's and shares for the patient experience and outcomes in the management of complex and or hard to heal wounds because those terms are interchangeable with single negative pressure wound therapy. So Jane's already discussed the national picture within the UK because of the guest data um, that we heard earlier. Um, so really what I wanted to do today was look at and explore further some of the healing rates and some of the patient and clinician outcomes. We know that healing rates are used a lot within the literature to define an expected trajectory of healing. And when healing doesn't match that outcome, then the wound may be considered hard to heal. So you can see on the slide here, we've got examples of both diabetic foot ulcers, venous leg ulcers, and pressure ulcers. So if we take the first example of a diabetic foot ulcer, where less than a 50% reduction within a four week period constitutes a non-healing wound. But as you can see, there are different parameters depending upon the etiology. So different for venous ulcers and different for pressure ulcers. What we know is that when we're thinking in general, because they're not always, we're not always easily able to group them into those etiology groups. And so um, Dr. Leanne Atkin and colleagues identified that any wound not healed between or after so between 40 to 50 percent, sorry, apologies, after four weeks of standardized care should be considered a hard to heal wound. But what we mean by standardized care isn't what's being delivered necessarily in your own organization, it's about what's evidence-based care. Now it may be that that's both in your area, which is really important. So I think uh, the other thing that the document talks about and the research that it talks about is how important it is to recognise that they are hard to heal and to start to think about um, troubleshooting or alternative strategies. And these might include referral to a multidisciplinary team or to a wound care specialist. Some of the specialists um, within that multidisciplinary team that you might consider referring to might include podiatry, plastics, dermatology and or nutrition, just to name a few. However, healing is not really the only outcome. We know that there are many wounds that we're going to be managing that may be palliative, so not expected to heal due to patient comorbidities. So they're going to require very different outcome measures. These outcome measures may not reflect improvement, but may consider maintenance approach or prevention of deterioration, and that might also include prevention of infection. It's really important to um, carry out a person-centered approach so that we consider what those patient outcomes are as, as our priorities, rather than being driven very much from a clinician perspective. So those patient outcomes may include something as simple as being able to take a shower, the ability to continue working, or how important the reduction of extra date is. And these are gonna be demonstrated a little bit more later on when we're going through some of the case studies. Measuring patient outcomes is not a new thing. So patient reported outcome measures commenced back in 2009, and predominantly then they were looking at orthopedic surgery, so specifically hips and knees. It also included at the time varicose veins and herniation or hernia, hernia surgery. They're all linked to an organizational trust and they're reflected on a dashboard, and that helps to support quality in the commissioning of new services. So these outcomes include quality of life measures. So specifically around the surgery, following the surgery, do they feel better? Are they moving better? Have they got better movement in their joints? In contrast to the outcome measures, we also have patient reported experience measures. That's slightly different. And that's really assessing the patient's experience of the healthcare environment. So were they treated with dignity and respect? But it's worth considering if your patient caseload is all complex or hard to heal, or a large percentage, and we've heard from Jane's presentation, it could be as many as 30%, it's important that you identify other key performance indicators to demonstrate your effectiveness as a clinician or your service and the positive impact you have on your patients' lives, not just be based around um, healing rates. We also need to recognize that some patient choices or preferred patient outcomes may impact on our objectives as clinicians, but it's really important that informed choice is vital in gaining patient and care engagement. It's important also to recognize these in any care planning. So we see commonly that it just says, you know, it might have uh, the aim of the wound to heal, but it's important that we're much more specific than that and, and take into account those patient, those patient choices. 
Jane has described some of the impacts on patients. Uh, we know that pain has a negative impact on additional health issues and pain management is often medication based and that may increase polypharmacy and the risks associated with this. High exudate levels and odour are likely to impact on relationships and the emotional well-being of patients. We know that the literature evidences the impact of depression on wound healing and also the impact of wound healing on depression and the fact that it can make patients' emotional well-being very low. The likelihood of increased cost to the patients also needs to be considered. So the longer a wound's healing uh, or takes to heal, we need to consider the cost to the patient, such as the cost for prescriptions, transport, for attendance of outpatient appointments, and that you need to match that with the potential that actually their income may be reduced. Jane mentioned social, is social isolation, and patients often impose that uh, on themselves due to the stigma and the experience of having a chronic wound. And this has never been more apparent during the last year or so, particularly within the pandemic, when access to resources for patients was either reduced or refused or reinforced by some patients, as actually they felt the risk of COVID was greater, so they refused that support or that access from clinicians. So moving on from that, I'd like to now share some patient experiences with you. And these case studies that I'm going to share were collated from both the tissue viability and the community nursing caseloads. And obviously we gain consent for all of these. So the first case study, number one, is a 68 year old gentleman. So despite his medical history of peripheral arterial disease, polymyalgic rheumatica and a previous deep vein thrombosis, this gentleman was extremely fit and active. He cycled, he was a keen and active badminton player. He was a non-smoker and had never smoked and he was not diabetic. Back in 2018, he was diagnosed with peripheral arterial disease. In 2019, he presented to the vascular team with deterioration of his toes on his right leg, specific areas of toes on his right leg. Now, over a 10 day period, they attempted a number of, of procedures to try and improve the vascular flow. They attempted a, a tibial angioplasty, but that failed. Unfortunately, they were, unable, they were unable to dilate that. He also suffered a severe reaction to iloprost, which is an intravenous vasodilator. Subsequently, there was further amputation of some of the necrotic toes, which then led to further surgery, which was a transmetatarsal amputation, and that was at day 10. That was really an attempt at limb salvage. The patient was adamant that they weren't going to, or they didn't want to undergo a lower limb amputation, although that was um, suggested at the time. So the patient was referred to the tissue viability team. You can see the image at the point at which he was referred. So there's quite a lot of devitalized tissue. And there was real concerns regarding the level of peripheral arterial disease and the impact and the, the failure to try and reperfuse the limb. So we had quite low expectations of healing. The limb and the wound itself was very painful. The patient required analgesia 30 minutes prior to dressing change. So we attempted a number of advanced therapies, applying larva therapy and top topical therapy to the wound bed. So the next slide um, shows again the image at the point of referral. And then the image on the right is following five months of those advanced wound therapies. Um, some of them in combination and some of them we rotated. What was important to the patient was that we were focused um, on trying to, to save the limb. He was not ready, as I said, to accept lower limb amputation, but we were quite honest about our expectations and we were working blindly. We didn't really know what the prognosis was. He felt it was really important to maintain the relationship that he had with his grandchildren. He had enforced some isolation with them in the fact that they were unaware of his surgery. So he didn't want them coming around while the wound was so open and it was so obvious that he'd had some surgery. So the next slide just show the uh, images of the wound from different aspects and also demonstrate the additional challenge we have with the plantar aspect of the foot. So the image that you can see on the far right of the slide, we really struggled to get that fissure to heal. Um, the gentleman had periodic episodes of fungal infection that required treatment and the wound also had moderate exudate levels. The patient was required to be non-weight bearing on that foot and that had come from the vascular team. However, as you'll see, that proved to be increasingly difficult um, over time as the wound started to improve. So we'd reached that point after five months and the decision was made then to initiate a single negative pressure wound therapy, which we know is PICO. 
So within 27 days, which equated to 10 dressing changes, this, this was the outcome that we'd obtained. So one of the benefits from having such a successful uh, result was that we were able to continue um, care with this gentleman, but actually share that with his wife, who was really happy to replace the dressing, take images and send weekly emails of those images to the tissue viability team. And we were able to support that shared care and follow up with a patient face to face uh, over a period of sort of four to six weeks, every four to six weeks. Going back to the non weight bearing situation, as the wound improved, it's really, really hard to hold him back. Um, and so actually, really that non-weight bearing became partial and full weight bearing when he was caught during an unexpected visit mowing the lawn. So in summary, um, despite the fact that he wasn't really uh, non-weight bearing through, during that uh, healing period, he did actually go on to heal and I'm really happy to report that two and a half years on he's still healed. Um, the impact of the patient was huge um, particularly the fact that he's retained his limb for two and a half years. So we know that the likelihood is that he will need amputation at some point. In that time, he was able to holiday with his family and grandchildren and was able to participate in leisure activities. I believe he played some football with them, I think using um, support and crutches at the time. He was really happy that he was able to shower um, and participate in shared care so that he had some control over you know, his visitations to the clinics, etc. that offered him much greater independence. So he was really, really happy with that. And I think the other thing that was really impactful for him was that at the point at which we initiated the, the PICO, that the dressing changes became pain-free. So case study number two really reflects some of Jane's um, presentation as well. When we're thinking about surgical wounds, we often think about the uh, really complex chronic wounds, but we need to consider the impact of dehis surgical wounds. So this is a 28 year old lady, as you can see, she had no medical history. Her only surgery was an emergency C-section, and we know that emergency surgery is a known risk factor for wound dehiscence and breakdown, but she was young, she had no other risk factors. This was her first baby and it remained in the breech position. Now in the UK, for mother and baby, once the baby's born, they're cared for for the following 10 days under the care of the midwife. And then after that, the care is taken over by the GP practice and the health visiting team. So following her C-section, and she was at home with a baby, the wound dehissed at day nine. And you can see from the image there. She commenced daily dressing changes for five weeks at the GP practice. But what I'd just like to make clear at this point is that this all occurred during the first lockdown. So this was March 2020, right, right at the very beginning. So she was being asked to attend GP surgery every day at 7.30 in the morning. She was clearly unable to drive because she just had a C-section. So her husband had to drive her and the baby, so obviously couldn't leave the baby, to the surgery every morning wait in the car park for her to go into practice, have the dressings replaced while she had a treatment. Obviously he was waiting there and then um, she would come back out and he would drive her home. The thing that she reported to us that was clearly was most significant for her was that she'd not had a shower since the wound had dehissed. And she was also really um, emotionally low in the because of the impact on her not being able to sort of go out and even walk around the garden um, with her uh, with her newborn baby because of the fear of uh, leaking with the dressing. So at the point after five weeks of daily dressing changes, she was referred to the wound care clinic, which at that point is being run by the tissue viability team. So from the image that you can see here, you can see day one and the point at which we, had, we conducted the initial assessment. Um, it looks quite innocuous as a wound. It doesn't look quite significant. There were no signs of infection, no peri-wound erythema. And so the cause was really considered to be more of a mechanical breakdown. Although the wound looked superficial, it probed two centimetres in depth. So it was determined at that point that actually the PICO dressing would help. It would reduce dressing changes and it would hopefully bolster and support those wound edges from the surgical site. As I said, her biggest frustration was lack of normality and even just taking the baby out into the garden. Sometimes the dressing itself would leak. Obviously, the, the significant uh, thing for her was the daily commitments of having to go to the surgery at 7.30 in the morning. 
So we initiated the single negative pressure, and you can see the image on the right is the image at day three. So the, um, and what you can see already, even at that point, is that there's been a reduction in depth and uh, the wound itself is so much more superficial with significant improvement. So in summary, the image that you can see on the right is five weeks, uh, is really just demonstrating, um, sorry, at day 16, when the wound, the dressing was removed and the patient was discharged. Now we think that probably the wound healed much earlier, but that was the point at which the dressing was replaced. We weren't in a hurry to remove the PICO too quickly, thinking about the risks of breakdown and dehiscence and the fact that she'd had that wound uh, for about five weeks. And we felt that there was that mechanical element of the breakdown. So we continued with the PICO. I think what's most significant is comparing the activity for this lady. So we're looking at daily dressing changes versus twice weekly dressing changes. Um, and then when you think about from the financial aspect, that's 35 dressing changes compared to five. For her, again, the most impactful um, element of using that um, advanced therapy was the impact of being able to shower and to feel like a real mum, she said in her words. The post healing checks identified that it's remained healed and the good news is that she's pregnant again. So case study number three is a 67 year old gentleman. So pretty much a minimal past medical history, just reported hypertension and diverticulitis. However, following a routine bowel screening, he was diagnosed with cancer of the rectum. So that meant, unfortunately, he ended up with a lower anterior resection of his colon and they formed an ileostomy. He did develop complications and unfortunately developed an, an anastomotic leak requiring a repair. So following the surgery, he was discharged to the community nursing team for wound management. And also, again, just to report that this was um, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic and the first lockdown. So, yes, he was referred to the community nursing team. However, uh, they didn't feel that he met the criteria for the community nursing caseload. So he was referred back to the GP practice. The GP practice refused as they were not carrying out face-to-face -face consultations at that time. In the meantime, we've got a gentleman who's had cancer, he's shielding, and uh, he needs some support with his wound. Fortunately, he visited the ward at that time for a review and they removed the sutures. The wound dehissed at that time. And so for the next four weeks, that gentleman was having to visit that hospital daily for those dressing changes bang in the middle of a pandemic, visiting a district general hospital to get his dressings changed. Fortunately, he was finally referred to the wound care clinic after a, a four week period. So these are the images that you can see. You can see the overall incision site. And in fact, there were two areas of dehiscence, one at the top of the wound and one at the bottom. And we decided with his permission to implement PICO and we were able to use one large dressing across the whole incision site. At his first follow-up on day four, you can see the image to the right, the top wound was practically healed, so we were able to reduce the pico size to just the lower wound. On this slide, you can see the lower wound slightly deeper at the bottom of the incision site. So the image on the left is to the point at presentation, and the image on the right was also day four. And already at that point, there's epithelializing tissue being formed in the wound bed. But again, because of the length of duration of the wound and the area that it is, we felt it was important to continue with the PICO to support that incision site. So on this slide, you can see at day seven, the second dressing change, but again, the same clinical rationale for continuing the PICO. It's just about support and ensuring that we support that to complete healing. So on day 16, the image you can see on the right, we've got complete healing. So that was his fourth visit, but we didn't need to, uh, to reapply a dressing as the wound had completely healed. So in summary, this gentleman experienced four weeks of daily dressing changes compared to two weeks. So this equated to 28 dressing changes compared to three, or equates to 28 hospital visits compared to four clinic visits. Again, we're seeing the similar themes that we've seen in the previous two case studies. You know, most significant for this gentleman was being able to shower, that he had reclaimed his own time management, so he wasn't beholden on, on visiting the, the ward daily. And I think the biggest thing that he reported was for both him and his family was the reduction in stress as he knew he was supposed to be shielding. 
And then lastly, the final case study was a 71-year-old gentleman who experienced a traumatic wound to his lower limb following a DIY accident. You can see an image here on the right and then a further image a little bit further on. So very little past medical history. The gentleman did smoke 20 to 40 a day. Um, he had a hematoma excised at four weeks post injury and unfortunately had to attend the emergency department with two episodes of cellulitis that required treatment. Due to the ongoing level of devitalized tissue and wound depth, it was felt that um, the wound required debridement, which it was done by the vascular team, and they commenced compression bandages immediately after that debridement, and he was then discharged home. They did decide to refer him to the plastics team for grafting um, because they felt that the, the wound size and depth was quite significant. He was also referred to the wound care clinic for assessment and management at that time. So this slide uh, shows again the wound, but just demonstrates the wound dimensions. So although it doesn't look that significant, it was 5.7 by three, but the depth of the wound was three centimeters. He expressed that the wound was very painful, um, but we were pleased to know that the vascular assessment had shown no peripheral arterial disease. So he was continued to be managed in the compression bandages. We discussed the, the likelihood of using single negative pressure with, in conjunction with the compression bandages with the patient, and he was really keen for that, so we were able to implement that. So the next slide shows, again, the initial presentation, so the point at which it was debrided, and the, the image on the right is just demonstrating what the wound looked like after 17 days of PICO and compression bandages. Now that constitutes seven dressing changes. We probably changed it more frequently than we needed to, but um, we were really, really pleased with the, the significant improvement, both in wound surface area, depth and also the, the level of new granulation tissue um, and the reduction in pain for the gentleman. So the next slide then shows the further progression that we achieved at day 45. Now we only then used a further four dressing changes, a total of 11 dressing changes, which obviously you can see is quite a significant reduction compared to the frequency of what we were delivering prior to that. But this was due to the fact that the gentleman went away for a period of a holiday with his family. And um, so at that point, we moved to hosiery so that he would be able to manage that himself. Um, but we continued, obviously, with the PICO. I think what was most important for us was that we it was good to be able to reduce the frequency of the negative pressure without fear of the granulation tissue adhering to the wound bed that we know happens with traditional, um, we all can happen with traditional negative pressure. So in summary, the final slide you can see here, um, for the patient, one of the biggest outcomes was that he didn't need further surgery and grafting, so that was significant for him. Again, showering has been a constant theme, but it just really demonstrates um, its importance to patients. He, again, demonstrated pain reduction, and this is featured in the majority of the cases. I think one of the biggest impacts with, in all of them has been the importance of family and relationships. So what I would just like to say, just as an observation, so the image you can see on the right is 45 days, and we think that's a really good reduction. So at that point, we discontinued the PICO, and we continued with conventional dressings, but continued obviously with hosiery. Um, and the rationale was that the wing was smaller, we'd made huge progress within that six week period. However, when we then re-evaluated the length of time it took for that wound to heal, even though it looks relatively small and, and shallow and superficial, it took a further three and a half months or 15, 14 weeks, sorry, to full closure. So on reflection and, and knowing what we know now, I think we it would have been much more um, advantageous to have continued to use the PICO for much longer. So those are some of the patient outcomes um, that we achieved as a result of, of using the PICO. But some of the advantages that we found as clinicians were that we were able to choose with the use of filler or not, depending upon the depth of the wound. So up to a depth of two centimetres, we may or may not use a filler. If we decided to use a filler, then we had a choice of filler, so we could choose a gauze or a foam. The zone of therapy that the negative pressure um, creates is really supportive for those incisional wounds. So it, it extends beyond the wound 
the wound site. So it supports the peri-wound areas. That's really important for those surgical wounds. And as I said, the ability to be able to reduce those dressing changes without fear of um, those with that granulation tissue adhering to any of the any of the fillers that we might use with traditional um, uh, negative pressure. So further, um, I suppose, clinician impact was that it also enhanced the opportunity for shared care. So we were able to reduce clinician and patient contact because we were assured and confident in its use, um, again, reducing the risk of infection. And also, I think the, the confidence was around the fact that it should the pump stop working, the dressing can remain intact and will operate as a foam without, without significant risk to the wound or patient that you would get with a pooling of exudate that we see with traditional negative pressure. It's really user friendly for both clinician and carer um, and as I said it's so easy to troubleshoot and significantly if you're transferring patients from one care setting to another care setting or across services or neighbouring organisations traditional um, advanced therapies particularly negative pressure is often quite challenging and is often determined by funding issues. However, because PICO is available on, on drug tariff, it offered quite a seamless transition and its use is really simple. So that meant we were able to offer simplified patient pathways for these patients and improve continuity of care. From an organisational impact, we know that it offers appropriate utilisation of resources, particularly when resources were so scarce that we see during the, the, the actual pandemic. It reduces clinician time, and that's the largest cost of wound care provision. Um, and we know that also it's we've demonstrated that we've improved both healing and quality outcomes. During the pandemic, it was initiated on a range of wounds that previously we may not have used in order to reduce face-to-face -face contact and be assured that we were reducing risk. However, what it has done is it's informed our practice as clinicians, it's increased our knowledge and skills, demonstrated its cost-effective use, and we probably do use it in areas that, as I said, we previously wouldn't have done. So from an organizational impact, we're demonstrating that we're meeting all the same um, targets and aims that the National Wound Care Strategy Program aim as part of or have as part of their vision for improving unwarranted variation and improving healing and reduction in harm for patients. So in summary, it's really just to, to say, and in summary for both mine and again, Jane's presentation is that we know that hard to heal wounds can be referred under a number of different names. So those terms are synonymous, hard to heal or complex. Um, hard to heal wounds we've seen and demonstrated are challenging, challenging for patients, for clinicians and also for the healthcare economy. It's really important that we identify patients early and look at the risk factors, what makes them likely to be hard to heal, and then ensure that we use evidence-based interventions to reduce time to healing and improve patient outcomes. I'd now like to hand back to Alec for the rest of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Jackie, and uh, thank you, Jane. Um, brilliant presentation, uh, well delivered. Jackie, I'm glad you made it through it. Uh, and Jane, I'm uh, very pleased that you've done your first presentation with us. We're look, looking forward to, uh, to many more. Um, I've been reading the questions coming through and the quest and the uh, reading the comments from the uh, viewers. And as always, there's, uh, there's hundreds of those. So without further ado, I'm going to get straight on with the Q&A, if you don't mind, so we, we can try and get through as many of the questions as we uh, as we possibly can this evening uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so so for those of you who are at home if we don't get through your question today uh, don't worry we what we always do is we take a uh, we, we, we basically download all of the comments and the questions we'll pass those on to Smith and nephew and to Jackie and Jane who'll have chance to uh, respond to them in their own time we'll then create a lovely document which will be uh, hosted on our website next to the uh, slides that you'll be able to download so uh, so do keep an eye out. Uh, and, and again, apologies if we don't manage to get through to your question this evening. Uh, do keep them coming, though, because uh, our team are just uh, are looking at those at the moment. Uh, so, Jane, this, this is the first question. This is for, for you. And this is from uh, Leanne. And this is what wounds or areas can PICO not be used on? <laughs> Yeah, PICO can be used on most wounds. Uh, the wound type that it generally is recommended not to be used on are, are cancer wounds uh, because of the effect on granulation tissue that can then, uh, if there are cancer cells in, in place, then it can exacerbate that. 
so otherwise paper can pretty much be used in any wound if you can get it to sit on the part of the body where it is and get it completely uh, sealed, which gives other challenges, but there are other ways to, of, of, of using it with, uh, with bridging or not necessarily placing the plaster exactly over the wound, but having a, a different uh, technique to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jackie, this one's for you. This is from Debbie. Uh, why don't TVNs, uh, sorry, there you go. We are live, you can see, because I've just lost that question. Um, here we go. Why don't TVNs promote the use of PICO sooner? It seems that the patients we see are started on NPWT or negative pressure wound therapy in secondary care. Okay, so I think um, that's quite a challenging um, question in the fact that obviously every area is so very different. So I think, you know, it depends on the organisation. Um, and I think we're, we're quite fortunate having an integrated trust because it allows for a much better uh, in terms of communication and dialogue and pathways. But actually, you know, Deb is absolutely right. We should be getting these pathways up and running. It's about having those conversations. And um, I think clearly, if you're able to demonstrate with some of your own small case studies, the, you know, the impact, just showing some of these today, the impact of, you know, you know, a couple of the patients have been having, you know, four to five weeks of daily dressing changes. And we know that the dressing itself is only about 6% of the total cost. So even if you can do your own small little case study, do some cost analysis and demonstrate that, you know, perhaps to the people that are paying and making that spend, um, you know, you might be able to help promote and implement those patient pathways much sooner. Um, there's lots of challenges with things like procurement issues that we have to, to meet. So sometimes it appears that it's something quite simple, but equally you can help support drive that, Debbie. So absolutely, you know, keep on asking those questions and being that critical friend. Why aren't we doing that? Because, you know, it's only then that we'll start to get more action and, and hopefully we can, you know, you, we can support you guys out there in terms of the management of your wounds. So, yeah, and I guess negative pressure now, uh, in particular, when you're talking about sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the modern devices, the pricing of these devices is very much different. So it's about changing the mindset of, yeah. of, uh, of who actually should be able to prescribe it. I think typically when devices are very expensive, um, you know, I understand why specialist nurses are the ones who have to initiate that, but it's a very different world, actually. So uh, definitely do uh, look into that, Debbie. Um, this is for, uh, for both of you, I think. Uh, this is from Karen. Uh, does the wound need to be shallow to apply PICO? And what depth can the wound be to use uh, PICO effectively? Jane, I'm going to start with you, if that's all right. Yes, that's perfectly fine. Uh, PICO, especially the new uh, PICO 7, which is was launched about oh, a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, that can uh, go into a wound which is up to seven centimetres deep, in fact. Uh, you need to use a filler, as Jackie had mentioned, whether it's a, 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 um, a, a foam filler or a, a gauze filler, a, a specific type of gauze filler, not a normal gauze, but it can be used to a wound that's seven centimetres deep. Uh, we have used it sometimes where there is under, undermining, where perhaps the, the wound itself is 10 centimetres long underneath the, the uh, tissue, but where it is two to three centimetres down underneath the tissue. Uh, very effective, yes. So no, not just shallow wounds, deep wounds as well. Does, um, before I uh, ask you, Jackie, because I think that's a fairly comprehensive answer. Do you know, uh, maybe somebody from Smith and Effie can tell us, do, do you know whether the fillers that you mentioned there, um, the specific type of gauze filler that you'd be required to use, does that come with the device? No, no you see Jackie's also shaking her <laughs> head. No, it yeah, doesn't. Jackie's shaking her head as well. <laughs> Jackie, do you want to do you want to jump in there? Sorry, I thought I'd right, ask the Jane? question because if it's if it's yeah. deep, then people need to think about if they're ordering Pico, then what they're yeah. you know what other things they need to be ordering with it for a specific wound type. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't come with that. Um, but then that does give you that choice because obviously that would increase expenditure, wouldn't it? If if everything all came together and then you've got something yeah. you don't need to use. Yeah. So yeah, I it, it is separate, but um, it's important that you're you know you're making those clinical decisions based on the wound itself. And we know that the pico itself can be used up to two centimeters without a filler. 
but it does depend on the wound. So what you want is as much contact as possible. So if you've got a wound, as Jane was saying, that's undermining or it's got very uneven wound bed, then actually a filler would be really helpful. If you've got a fairly clear wound and you can observe most of the base of the wound, then you may not. You may get away with actually not needing to use a filler as long as it's not greater than two centimetre depth. So there is a little bit of clinical kind of decision making there. And it's just about gaining those that knowledge and skills and knowing what works and um, to help you make those decisions and those choices. OK, well, um, next question. This is from Eden. This is can Pico be used on any type of wound? Um, Jackie, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I think it's similar to what Jane was saying, obviously, because, you know, we we know that Pico and negative pressure, one of the actions is that it absorbs a lot of exudate and draws fluid from the wound bed. But the other thing it does is it does enhance proliferation of granulation tissue. So if, as Jane was saying, if you've got some cancerous cells, you need to make sure that you've excluded that because you know, there is a that theoretical risk that you're going to increase those that cellular production as well, which is what we wouldn't want. So as Jane said, most wounds um, absolutely suitable for, I guess, again, clinical rational decision making would be probably more based on wound depth and level of exudate. So you don't have a canister like you would with traditional negative pressure. So the, the volume levels, some of that is kind of expired through the dressing, but it's not going to cope with the same volume of exudate that your traditional negative pressure would. So that's where your judgment, for me, that's where the judgment call would be. You may find that if you're using it on a wound with really large exudate levels, you're going to be changing it really frequently and you might change it more daily. So that might be your clinical decision making as to why you would choose traditional as opposed to the Pico. Okay, Jane, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, the only thing I was thinking was it's also very important to use a the plaster, the Pico plaster. Uh, not one that just fits to the size of the of the circumference of the wound. It needs to be quite a bit larger, so it's coming out over the uh, surrounding intact skin, uh, at least two centimeters, if not five centimeters, because you're getting a, a greater effect of the uh, 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 vacuum effect, negative pressure effect over a wider area. And the larger dressings can also contain a little bit more exudate as well. Although, as Jackie says, there are some some dressings, depending on well, some wounds, if they exudate very much, then you do need to change them daily sometimes. But hopefully, many times, it's not for a long period of time that you need to change them daily. Brilliant. Um, so we've got two more questions. Uh, the, the this next question I actually saw it come in. I think it's a really interesting one. It is uh, this is from Karen, uh, and this is uh, what is the indication to remove pico? Is it exudate levels, wound depth, or length of time? Uh, we'll go to you both because I can see you both smiling. So we'll start with you, Jackie. What what? Uh, a bit of all of that. Mean? A bit of a all, bit of, all of that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the battery pack itself, so the pump itself is designed to operate for a length of time. So, and then you get a little bit of leeway. So obviously at the point at which that, that suction and that negative pressure stops functioning, ideally you're gonna to wanna to change it to get the maximum impact from the dressing. So for sure, that's gonna be one of your parameters as it comes to the end of its battery life, do I need to change it? Um, and it also may be that um, there's quite some good information on the batch pack itself that tells you when the dressing is saturated. So, you know, if you if you're able to, you could wait till that happens before you change it. But for some of us, we're often getting patients back in. We kind of make a judgment call about what that extra date level will be. Maybe bring them back in at day three or day four and change it. It might not be ready to change, but it gives us information then for the next time. So for me, it would be about um, exudate levels, how well the dressings manage those exudate levels, and you know, has has that battery run out of time, and, and do we need to replace it? Okay, thank you, uh, Jane. Over to yes, you. all completely relevant. Uh, what Jackie yeah. said there, I, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, when we stop using Pico completely. Uh, mm -hmm. From what Karen has said, but the the points that you made there, Jackie, also completely relevant. Um, because uh, Karen's asked about depth or the size or the extra days and and again it can be all of those things uh, we tend to use it for 14 days and if we've got a good result then we will stop and hope that as the study some studies have shown that uh, the effect on healing will continue 
at a fast rate as it has done. If it doesn't do that, then we'll start PICO up again. But if we've got some wounds which have really been there for a long time and we do have some, a small effect with PICO, then we could, got you, we could use it for four weeks. So it's very much dependent on what the effect is for the patient and the wound, of course, and what our expectations are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, two good, um, two good sort of uh, uh, responses there uh, in sort of you know whether you're ch you know whether you're changing it sort of uh, as part of the the progressive treatment or whether you're changing it um, at, at the very end. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that uh, answered your question, Karen. Um, we are. Um, we are out of time, but I am just going to ask this last question because it's a very interesting one, and I know that you touched on it at the beginning. So uh, this is for this is for you, Jackie. Um, have you managed any cost challenges using? Have you managed? Have you managed? It says, have you managed? Um, how have you managed any cost <laughs> challenges using uh, negative pressure um, as they cost a lot more than standard dressings? They do. Um, I mean, I think that's important to monitor patients. And as I was saying earlier, when Debbie asked the same question, is to have those little mini case studies, you know, work out how many times you've gone to visit that patient, that the frequency of the activity of the clinician, you know, there are generalised kind of average costs per dressing for um, community nurse visits. So if you're in a community nurse setting, but also your financial advisor within that organisation will be able to tell you an average cost. And if you work that out, so if you think about some of the case studies I showed today, if you imagine the cost of that clinician activity for daily dressing changes for five weeks compared to clinician activity for four visits, you know, th there is no comparison. And equally, I think, you know, I'm hoping that what we demonstrated today was that actually it's not just about healing. Yes, that's important. But actually what we've demonstrated is the, the impact in terms of quality of life and patient experience as well. And that can't be underestimated. However, I know that, you know, with the purse strings, people are always thinking about that. But actually what we can say is that the dressing itself is such a small element, we think it's about 6% of the total yeah. cost. So you need to demonstrate that, do your own mini, you know, activity, kind of almost like a little cost, cost effectiveness um, case study yourself and then demonstrate that. Yeah, I think uh, Jane, you mentioned at the very beginning, actually, as part of the uh, as part of the recent guest paper, they they said that actually the cost of dressings is uh, is sort of you know between five and six percent of yeah. the total cost of uh, of the burden of wounds. So I think the cut it's a it's an easy one for people to look at the price of a dressing and to say, mm -hmm. oh, that's very expensive. But actually, in comparison to the whole treatment of any patient with a chronic wound, it's such a small amount that it, it's almost insignificant really in terms of looking at the unit cost of whether it's a device like this or whether we're talking about any other type of dressing. So, uh, but a good question, very interesting, fairly political that one. So we don't really have time to get into a big debate about that. Um, Jane, Jackie, uh, thank you very much for your uh, support this evening. I, I've, I've certainly really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to thank Smith and Nephew for their continued support, in particular to Mike Steele, who I know has been working very, very hard to put the uh, slides uh, together with, uh, with you both. Uh, thank you very much to my team who are all working this evening, and thank you very much to Mold Digital for uh, your support in, uh, in streaming this event this evening. We couldn't do these events without you, uh, the audience watching from wherever you are. Um, I hope you all are, are, are a little wiser after watching the presentation and, you know, have a glass of wine in, the ha in your hand to, uh, to go and enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, there should be a link on the screen now uh, where you can download uh, your certificates. And remember, uh, we'll be back in uh, we'll be back in a few weeks time. And if you do have any questions, if you're watching this on catch up and you have any questions, do post them. Um, into the comments section. We'll keep looking at those. We'll put the video up onto our website tomorrow, along with the slides. And in a few uh, in a few days or maybe a few weeks' time, we'll put the uh, responses to all of the other questions. One final thing to me, shameless plug for me, if uh, if you're all still there and can hold on to me just for another thirty seconds. Uh, today we had our first face to face event in eighteen months. We were in Blackpool with our journal of community nursing events. We had a, a great turnout. We're in Durham next week, so if you're in the area, do come along and join us. That's on Wednesday. And on the 19th and 20th of October, we're back with our national conference in Milton Keynes. That's Wound Care Today. Smith and Nephew will be there. 
Pico will be there. So if you want to come along, you'll be able to get your you physically get your hands on one of the uh, one of the devices. Uh, if you do come along and you see me, uh, please do come and say hello. You can register online. The website should be available on the uh, on the screen now. Uh, we'll be back soon. Jane, Jackie, thank you very much again and good night. Thank you. Good night.